All right, good Tuesday morning, everyone. We are on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with Jim Cramer to talk about the markets. And Jim, let's begin with oil plunging. Yeah, now the, our target had been 43, and I ride that because Carly Garner, who I regard as being one of the great commodities people of our time, who writes for real money, had been saying, listen, we're going to make a stand at 43, maybe we break it, and then maybe we come uh, bounce back. She says it's going, it's going to be pretty messy right here. I contacted her, of course, because when it was at 53, she said it was going to 43. So she has tremendous, tremendous credibility in my eyes. And I look at it and I say to myself, okay, you don't immediately lower your target. If your target was 43, don't start saying it's 41. There's a, there was someone on this morning who was saying, hey, listen, I think it's going to trade the high 30s. I'm with Carly. I think it makes kind of a stand here. And I think you get a whoosh back. Mm. And we also saw quite a rebound in tech stocks. Yeah, I mean, tech, it looks like the seller stopped them. I'd like, I'm trying to get people to understand the way trading works. And what, the way trading works is we have these very big firms, and they, let's say they switch and say, we have too much tech. Well, you can't just unload tech anymore. What happens is there's a great dislocation because uh, firms don't principle like they used to. I had Lloyd Blankfein on last, and he said, listen, yeah. there's, there is an issue of intent. You can't just go buy all the stock from someone. A regulator might find that your, your intent is to profit from that, when the reality is, is that you're, all you're trying to do is what's known as positioning in order to make it so that you can then find buyers. So someone, you, you can't position anymore. So what, it's very dicey to position, because the regulators might say, what are you doing? Uh, so instead, these guys come in and they blow out a stock, the buyers know they're blowing out, so the buyers walk away, uh, which is a shame. They should be in there buying. You see it. You, you've got to have courage to buy the dip. That's one of the reasons why people think, wow, you know, a dip. Well, it's just such a, uh, such a ridiculous way to do things. Well, it has to do with the notion that that's the point of most pain because the big sellers come in, you don't know when the seller's done, so you have to buy on that dip, the seller's clearly finished, and then once the seller's finished, whoosh, right back up. That has been the pattern now for many years. It looks like to be the pattern again. You mentioned Lloyd Blankfein, that was a fabulous interview. You got him to talk about tweeting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Lloyd is, uh, he's done with letting the firm be characterized by others. Uh, he wants it to be characterized by himself. Three of six, by the way, have been somewhat critical of the president. He said, look, I reflect the, I want to defend the institution. Now, I mean, I've known Lloyd for, uh, for, for 30, let's see, 1983. Um, I don't know, 34 years. Wow. And uh, Lloyd is a guy who, uh, represents to me a lot. I mean, I, I just play with an open hand. I mean, I've known him for a long time. He was very helpful for me in my career. He's always very kind to me. And it's very hard to say anything other than good, good works because they came through the Great Recession well. And, but he did say something very interesting. He said, if you came through it well, that means you must have done bad. And he doesn't want that to be that kind of defining thing. He also explained once again how people are supposed to be committed to public service as part of their job. Now, you could say even that is cynical. It's like, oh, of course, that's to be able to join boards and meet wealthy people and get and then get their business. Now, is it a virtuous circle? I mean, here's what I say. I, I, I could have made more money had I not had to go do you know, go to community service. I, uh, you could have, I mean, but that's, you know, that's short-term greedy, that's not the way he thinks. Also, I mean, let me point out that there are people who do revolving door. Like, they go work for their company, then they go to government, they learn things, and then they go back to the government, go back to their firm, and uh, really uh, profit off what they learn from the government. And that's pretty venal. Um, the people I work with at Goldman, who then went, subsequently went on, did not go back. It was like, I did my time, I made my money, and now I'm going to go do the great things. And that was really another lesson that I learned at the firm, which is that, you know, you can make enough money, and once you've made enough money, why don't you go do something good? Now, somehow, that's been interpreted as being Goldman having these uh, octopus tentacles everywhere. But what it really was, was the ethos. The ethos was you made a lot of money, go do something for the government, go do something good for the world. And a vast majority of my friends who retire from Goldman, and many of them have because they did very did well, are doing these great things. Uh, building schools or working on the environment or helping certain charities full time or or, or or doing things that are great for themselves but also great for humanity or helping particular causes. I could go over and over and over the number of people at Goldman who are working, uh, who work at Goldman 
when I was there, who are now doing these great charities, or they're working in government, Mnuchin, or mm. oh, you know, obviously Gary Cohn, who is a, who was a friend. And I was joking with Lloyd. It's like you know, you want to have. I mean, I know Gary pretty well, and you have to call Mr. Cohn or you know whatever. Yeah, and I don't like to pretend because uh, I'm not. A, you know, I'm a guy who was a business guy who came into journalism. And it's hard for me to act as if I don't know who Gary Cohn is when I was at his birthday party last year. <laughs> it's hard for me to say I don't know Lloyd when Lloyd was the only person who was nice to me for the first six months that I was at Goldman. I mean, you remember this stuff. And, and, and so it's a little more problematic for me to assert myself. Uh, no, I do it. I want to do what's right for the viewers. I always want to do so. I asked, you know, I asked the question about whether the, you know, they were fined. I mean, what was that all about? Right. I asked the question, wouldn't they do better without the Volcker rule? I do my job. But but I also do my job within the confines of being conversational, not trying to play gotcha, because I just don't think there's a gotcha there. And Jim, you have another big interview coming up tonight on Mad Money with the CEO of IBM. Yeah, Ginny Rometty is a person who I think has tried mightily to get IBM to be far more analytical, far more cognitive. That's what the Watson stand, stands for, uh, artificial intelligence. All the things that we hear about from the great people uh, in tech right now, whether it be uh, Jeff Bezos, whether it be Mark Benioff, uh, whether it be the people who run Google, or people who run Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. The issue here is they've got a big legacy business. And how do you... Uh, deal with that legacy business which hurts your gross margins and is dropping off and at the same time be able to make uh, enough money on the cognitive businesses on the you know these special businesses that are growing fast and also how do we deal with the Warren Buffett issue that he decided that he didn't want to be as big although he still owns a lot how do we how does Ginny Romani deal frankly I'm gonna ask her there's so few women it, who are CEOs and, you know that's uh, like my kids I have two daughters and they're saying dad you never have women on. And I say, no, I do have women on. I try to have as many women on as possible. It's just that there's not many women CEOs. And, and my daughters don't understand that at all. They say, well, Dad, you just better get them all. And, and <laughs> I, I'm fortunate enough to have Ginny Rometty, but I'm also always thinking in the back of my mind that my two daughters are saying, Dad, what is it about women that you won't put them on? And I have to explain the real situation. All right, that's tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern on CNBC. Jim, also, NVIDIA was upgraded by Pacific Crest, but more importantly, your dog, Everest, yeah, you his know, Everest, name... I mean, what is it? Why are dogs only have a name, <laughs> one name? I mean, it's ridiculous. Everest sits down at dinner with me. I don't want him to. He just is a poacher. <laughs> but I just feel like it should be more formal. So I have said that he is a last name, and his name is NVIDIA. And from now on, He's Mr. Everest NVIDIA. And uh, I put a picture up, I tweeted him, and <laughs> Mr. NVIDIA will be treated with a different level of respect. And I urge you to send me your dog with a picture, okay? And I want the dog named Stock. Now listen, NVIDIA's taken, okay? So you gotta come up with a creative name <laughs> that looks and feels like your dog, uh, that's a stock that's been good to you, and I'll retweet the best. Because I think that every dog deserves a last name. Everest is a total rescue dog. He's a complete mutt. He is like 40 different kinds of dog, okay? But you know what? Dogs deserve respect. So his name is Mr. Everest NVIDIA. Well, is Bug going to get jealous? I, you know what? <laughs> Bug is... You know, Bug is like my night, I, you know, it's like Oscar Mayer with Bug. You know, he's got a first name and a last. I don't know. I haven't decided what Bug's name should be yet, right. but he deserves... I don't know, Everest has been so much better to me of late, and Bug has really shown me so little respect. And right now, right now he's fine as Bug, but NVIDIA's Mr. Everest, you know, Everest, Mr. Mr. NVIDIA. I have to tell you, I'm gonna be with Bug uh, tomorrow. If he doesn't clean up his act, I may not even call him Bug. Whoa. Yeah, That's he's gonna be news. chief. I'm gonna chief him. That's what I do, or sport, or skipper. He shows me zero respect. Whoa. He's got to stop peeing in a goddamn corner there, too. I mean, what is that about? Right. I mean, you know, hey, well, that's a little granular. Maybe too much information. Bug, listen up. Yeah, Everest <laughs> does not ever. Mr. Mr. NVIDIA would never do anything like that. <laughs> never. No. It's just not a stop. <laughs> All right, Jim, let's also talk about Amazon. Hopefully, CEO John Mackey loves Amazon. Yeah, you know, I mean, he hates Jana. I mean, yeah. I love, I, John, I've known John for a long time. Uh, John had made so many upgrades, and Jana was still persistent when he put Ron Shake on the board, uh, elevating Gabby Sulzberger to the chairman and bringing some outsider CF, new CFO. And it was never enough for Jana. Jana wanted it sold. And I think at the end, John Mackey said, you know what, I don't need this. I don't need this. I'd rather just hook up with Amazon and dominate. Uh, I, I have tremendous respect for John and what he built. 
Uh, he built a great institution. I love the shop there. I know the numbers have not been great of late, but uh, let's have respect for this man who built an amazing institution. All right, and then on Mad Dash on Squawk in the Street, you talked about McDonald's. Yeah, you, look, Steve Easterbrook, does he get enough credit? I mean, remember when everybody said sell the stock because we've now annualized the all-day breakfast as if he were a one-dimensional character? This is a man who understands the actual uh, mojo. I, I asked him if I could use the word mojo. He said it was okay to use the word mojo. Mojo of the franchisees. He's got them energized. He's got them adding shifts. He's got them adding workers. He simplified the menu. You no longer need to be from MIT or Stanford Computing in order to be able to understand the menu uh, and, and the changes. He's brought great value. He's bringing digital. What more can you ask? How about a $180 target, a target price from Cowan? All right, and then on Stop Trading, you talked about Paychex. Yeah, you know, Paychex is a company, a very high taxpayer, the American company, and, but versus doing a terrific job with the float, the money that they take in, in order, you know, and then they issue checks, they get that little float those days, and that's terrific as the Fed raises rates, but they said, but these guys, Goldman says it's not enough, and it's also a question, I mean, it's almost like they're saying that uh, tax reform is also going to hurt economic expansion, because it's not happening. This is a kind of pushback to say what Treasury Secretary Mnuchin is saying, which is that it's all systems go. I'm just not seeing the all systems go, frankly. What did you make of Lennar's quarterly results? Well, I, I haven't been able to listen to the conference call. I, I saw that Stuart Miller put up excellent numbers once again. Lenore and Toll Brothers have been fantastic stocks. They tend to have, go in fits and starts. They go up, then they shrink back a little bit, then they go up again. Lenore's got the best numbers in 10 years. How do you quarrel with that? All right, and then Jim, will end as we always do with earnings to watch. We have a few names today. Adobe and Actual Earths Plus name. Yes, now, I mean, Adobe, let me be <clears throat> very, very consistent on Adobe. Uh, we bought a ton of Adobe last time when it reported because people didn't like the quarter. And then when they took a deeper look, they loved the quarter. So keep your powder dry mm. if you don't own Adobe. I think a better chance could come. If it doesn't, what can I do? FedEx is also reporting. FedEx, I think, is, I want to hear what they have to say about privatization. Now, UPS announced the surcharge. I think FedEx gives FedEx a chance to also put through a surcharge for the busy times. Uh, I do think that FedEx, I wish that they would turn over the air, you know, many airports to FedEx. They know how to run an airport. All right, and then on Wednesday, we have Oracle reporting. Oracle has consistently made the quarter of late uh, after being inconsistent for a while. They have a burgeoning cloud business uh, that L Larry Ellison and Mark Hurd's going to talk about. Safra Katz met with the president yesterday. She's one of the most accomplished people in Silicon Valley. I really like these people. I think they'll do a good number. The problem is it's got no beta. I mean, it doesn't move much. But you know what? For a quiet stock that's going up quietly where they're buying back a lot of stock, that's Oracle. All right, then we also had one more name, Chipotle, also is expecting some higher costs. Okay, Chipotle, uh, I, why are people shocked by this? Of course they're going to expect higher costs. I mean, they've said it over and over again. Remember, 18 months, and then you're going to have uh, what I regard as being a very, a very forgiving public. You have to go 18 months to have a forgiving public, though, and we're almost there. Remember, December 7th, 2015, and, and once the people have really forgotten, then the marketing costs can go down. All right, Jim Kramer, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much Thank as you. always. All right, for more information on the stocks you mentioned, please head back to thestreet.com.